fantastic to see so many people uh, dialing in today. Um, it's just a real shame, of course. I would absolutely love to be there in person. Uh, I think the conference, the conference thing is so good when you get to meet new people and, and hang out together in the, the same space. But, you know, hey, we're in 2020, uh, and it seems this is the way the world is just now and for the foreseeable future. Um, but 2020 really has been an incredible year. I mean, starting with uh, some quite incredible US drone strikes, unfortunately. Um, we've seen people in Hong Kong who are fighting to maintain their democracy. We've seen some horrific uh, bushfires in Australia this year, really driving species to extinction um, and making so many people homeless. Uh, and I think probably most terrifying with this is it's, it's quite possibly the most clear uh, or most damning example of the fact of uh, climate change and all the, the different environmental challenges that we have right now. Of course, this year as well also saw the, the brutal killing of, of George Floyd and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement who are fighting for a much more equitable world for everyone. We've seen uh, horrific blasts and horrific damage uh, in Beirut. It was absolutely terrifying. But then, of course, we're also seeing uh, brand new business models emerging for the Four Seasons total landscaping business. So perhaps not absolutely everything is terrible. There are new business opportunities out there. But nonetheless, all of this, of course, is happening to this incredible uh, backstory of a pandemic. Um, it's changing the way we work. It's changing the way we, we hook up and, and chat at conferences. Um, it's fundamentally changing everything. Um, and that has to have an impact, of course, on any software that we develop, any digital products, services, or business models that we, uh, we bring together to benefit our businesses, benefit our customers, and benefit society. Um, that means that quite often there's much more risk involved with anything that we want to explore and anything that we want to, to develop. And you know, taking risky bets is something that we've been quite bad at in enterprises and in businesses for a long, long time. You know, I think we've probably all been in the situation where we spent many months, sometimes even years, working on products and services to, to realize that they don't really have the impact that they were intended to have. But Arnold Rothstein, he's somebody who never tended to do that. Arnold Rothstein was a key figure back in 1920s America right at the time of Prohibition. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know that Prohibition in the United States was when it was outlawed to be able to uh, sell or buy alcohol of any kind. Um, but Arnold Rothstein, being a, a really, a really business-minded person, saw the opportunity in this. Um, and in many ways, he's become known as the founding father of modern crime. So he used to run uh, his mobs and essentially his business um, so that they could import whiskey all the way from Scotland right across into America and sell that whiskey to the high societies. But Rothstein is well known for saying that he would never bet on an event whose outcome I'm not sure of in advance. Um, and this kind of got me to thinking, with all of the, the big challenges that we have in society today, uh, and with all of the new technologies, the new practices, the new processes that we have that weren't around in 1920s America, what would Rothstein do today if he was faced with the same challenge? What would he do today with all of these different new approaches that we have in order to more effectively sell whiskey to the high society? My proposition to all of you is one of the things that Rothstein would do is start with a design sprint. Um, now, a design sprint, quite simply, is a, a, very, a very short process that allows you to explore a business opportunity or a, a problem space and go all the way through to a high quality, high fidelity prototype that we can get customer feedback on within only a few days, between three and five days. It bears no relation really to the concept of sprints that many of you I'm sure are familiar with uh, already within your organizations. And um, this really is fundamentally about getting early feedback to understand whether or not we should continue to invest in a product, a service, or an idea of any kind. So I thought, how can we go about explaining what this process is like? And I thought perhaps the best way to do it is actually to run through some design sprints with all of you here today. 
So the starting point for the three design sprints that we're going to do is to define who's going to be an Arnold Rothstein sprint team. So first of all, first of all, of course, you've got Arnold Rothstein himself. He was once upon a time known as the Big Fix. He was rumoured to have um, to have actually fixed the World Series uh, and been responsible for rigging that in such a way that he was able to make a huge amount of money from it. An exceptionally intelligent person, but the key thing with Rothstein here is he was very well hooked in to the high society. People who he believed were willing to buy really expensive whiskey. So this is somebody that in this case deeply understands the customer and deeply understands the business space that he wants to, wants to be going into. Now, because of that expertise, we're going to give Rothstein a very particular role during the three design sprints that we have. Um, and he's going to be known as the decider. So any point we get to a critical decision, and perhaps there's not disagreement in the room, Rothstein is the one who's going to have the casting vote. Next on the sprint team this week is Al Capone. Uh, Al Capone, a very famous uh, character, again, from the, the mob era, uh, otherwise known as Scarface. Uh, I think this particular photo of him was taken just before he went on vacation to Alcatraz High Security uh, Penitentiary. Uh, but I think... What many people didn't know about Al Capone was he actually had a fantastic capability for public relations and communication. Um, he used to arrange and promote boxing fights. He then used the, the tickets to win favors from different friends and get close to uh, people that he believed could benefit him. Um, but he also ran soup kitchens in very deprived areas uh, where he came from. So he really built up a, a big reputation because of his PR skills. And that, of course, is going to be very important for the team today. Third member in the team, we have Virginia Hill. Um, Time magazine uh, once crowned Virginia Hill as the queen of the gangster malls. Um, she's otherwise been described as a clearinghouse for all of the, the key information that would flow through uh, all of the mobsters' ranks uh, back in that time. Um, and one of Virginia Hill's very um, exceptional talents was logistics. Uh, she essentially ran this as a, a courier system, whether exchanging messages between people or exchanging perhaps some much more sensitive things. So this is someone who deeply understands the logistics network that could be essential for distributing whiskey. Uh, then, of course, we have Lucky Luciano. Uh, Lucky Luciano became the modern father of the Genovese crime family. Um, he was big into rum running, uh, and he did this along with his close friend, Frank Costello. The two of them were really closely linked and worked for Rothstein uh, back in the 1920s. Uh, but a couple of um, really interesting characters who really knew the details of the smuggling business, how to import some of these, uh, some of these products, uh, and how to go about just generally getting the wheels lubricated and moving forward. Um, Mayor Lansky. This is the, the second to last person who will be along on today's sprint. Uh, he was known as the mob's accountant. Um, he, he had a massive ga uh, global gambling uh, syndicate. Um, he made a huge amount of money. He was able to really look after all of the finances for much of the mob. So somebody who really understands the finance of the business model. And then the final person who's going to participate in the design sprints is Ma Barker. Uh, Mar Barker was uh, the mother and the key organizer behind the Barker Street Gang back in the days, uh, a particularly notorious group of uh, violent criminals and thieves. Um, but her ability to organize and control those quite rowdy people uh, was exceptional. And for that reason, we're going to give Mar Barker a key role in today's design sprints as well. She's going to be the facilitator. Now, the facilitator is the person responsible for keeping everybody on track and talking about the right things over the course of the week. Now, a design sprint, I would say, if any of you go on to, to try this for yourselves, it is a, a very tiring and a very high-paced week. Um, there's a huge amount of progress that needs to be made, and having a strong facilitator in this role, um, they don't need to necessarily know the business details, but they need to be good at keeping people moving. That is key. So Rothstein's a decider, Ma Barker is coming along as a facilitator, 
and then a huge range of different expertise that could be valuable for any products or services we design spread across the rest of the team. So now that we have our team, we're going to start getting into the very first design sprint. And day number one, the Monday, is dedicated to mapping. Um, and when I say mapping, what I mean is mapping out the problem space all the way from the customer through to achieving the goals that we want to achieve. But at the very beginning of the day, before we get started on mapping, of course, we need to welcome everybody and let everybody know what's going to happen over the course of the week. So, you know, Rostin and Mabarka start by saying, well, on the Monday, we're going to map the problem space. We're going to really understand what it means for the high society to want to get whiskey all the way through to them having that in their hands and everything in between. On the Tuesday, we're going to start identifying how some of the big challenges in that space are solved in different industries by different businesses. And we're also going to start throwing about some ideas of our own to see if we can mix and match to come up with something that looks like a good solution to prototype and get customer feedback on over the course of this week. By the Wednesday, we're on to deciding. So we've already spent two days just really deeply understanding the problem space or the opportunity space. Only by the Wednesday do we really narrow in on exactly what we want to achieve over the course of this five-day process. And then, quite quickly, we got on to prototyping. And this is where much of the magic really happens in the design sprint, because this is where we have to get really creative about how we can create high-fidelity prototypes to put in front of real people, real customers, to get high-quality feedback. Now, for all, of this, for all of us in this call today, we'll recognize that the things that we see, they aren't built. Um, we have to take as much of the technology out of these as possible in order to make the progress that we need. Um, but for many customers that we work with, they will believe it's real just through seeing that prototype. And that's going to be quite important. And then the final day of the week, we're on to testing. And this is where we get to put that prototype in front of customers and get some real feedback on whether or not it achieves the business goals that we want it to or the customer goals that we want it to. So just within five days, we go all the way from problem space, opportunity space to customer feedback, uh, which is a big improvement on waiting six months or a year to build something to find out if it works. So we've outlined for the team on the design sprint what's going to happen over the course of the week. And with this, Rothstein steps up and now introduces exactly what the problem space and the goal is going to be. And I think he would say something like this. There's going to be a growing demand for good whiskey during prohibition. And when I say good whiskey, that is exactly what I mean. I'm not talking about the rock gut rubbish that you and your friends down in the Lower East Side are creating in your chamber pots. I'm talking about the best Scotch whiskey from Scotland. There's a fortune to be made from importing the stuff. Now, <clears throat> as you know, I mix with the high society people. I know what they want and I know that they have money. It's going to be the chic thing to have good whiskey when you have guests and the rich are going to vie with one another to be lavish with the whiskey. But first, I want to lay down a very important principle. And this is something that I want to be very clear about. We must maintain a reputation for having only the very best whiskey. And with that, Rustin has started to set out what the long-term objective is for the design sprints. We're going to be focusing on the supply of high-quality whiskey to society people. But in that short monologue, there's a number of different assumptions that are already baked into the problem space that we want to explore. So, for example, is it really true that demand for good whiskey is going to grow during prohibition? Is it really going to be so chic to serve guests good whiskey? Um, it's a big assumption. Perhaps the high society people really aren't going to care and it's not going to be that cool. Are the rich really going to care so much that they actually start to compete in this front? Um, I think it's fair to say that Rothstein's business model depends upon people 
wanting to get the very best product and enter into that kind of competition. And then finally, and perhaps the, the biggest assumption in here is that people are going to care so much about whiskey that they actually choose to ignore prohibition laws. Now that is a, a massive assumption and the kinds of assumptions that we quite often build software in our businesses for many, many months and years on without ever getting to the bottom and find out there's no value at the end. So here with the design sprint, we're actually speaking about these on the Monday, on the very morning that we kick off. And then what happens now is we start to introduce a concept that becomes very important over the course of a, a design sprint, which is dot voting. So you've got Al Capone with his guns, you've got Ross Steam with his brains, you've got a huge range of people in between, many of them quite violent. How do we prevent them turning to fighting within the session in order to be able to get across their idea? Well, by allowing people to dot vote on the different ideas, hopefully we start to democratize a little bit of that decision-making process. And you can see here the biggest assumption that the group collectively think is uh, what we want to bottom out this week is that idea of are people really going to ignore prohibition laws? So that's going to become a key sprint question for us this week. Now from there, understanding that assumption, we can start to move on to mapping out the customer space. So we know we're starting with a customer who is a society person, somebody with lots of money, lots of social equity, uh, and they really want to impress their, their friends and peers. Now that society person is gonna to have to have some way of asking for options on whiskey, what whiskey is available. Um, there has to of course then be some way of checking those options with a customer contact with Rostings. You know, does he have salespeople or does, it, does this come straight into Rostings himself or, or some key friends who are then of course gonna to need to be able to check the available stock with some kind of distribution manager. Now, this really is a big scale effort and a big business operation. So we need to have these, these uh, things built into the business. Um, that then needs to come back to the customer to say, here are the options. We can give you this just now. Uh, we can import this. It will be with you in a few weeks or somebody else already has this one, but this one's unique. So some way of communicating those different order options. And then if we're lucky, this is going to go on to a confirmed order of whiskey. Um, well, then arrange delivery and if the logistics all work out, the high society receive their whiskey and they can have a merry old party after that. Now, this is probably a really good representation of the, the key things within the business uh, process and being able to achieve that outcome. But no matter who you have in this session, there will always be additional perspectives that simply aren't captured or aren't brought into this process uh, just by having them in the room. So we always tend to, on the Monday, in particular Monday afternoon, phone in some subject matter expertise or bring people into the session. Um, might be customers, they might be specialist skills from, from within your business, um, but they inevitably can look at this and see different key things that perhaps have been missed. So in this case, for example, um, despite being top-end mobsters, Nobody, nobody remembered that they have to pay the bribes to the authorities. So by phoning in the, the chief of police uh, or someone from the authorities, they're able to realize we've not considered bribes as a key part of the map that we were already missing. So we've made the, the map that little bit more valuable just by involving additional people. Now, over the course of, um, of producing this kind of map, the team you know, individually, they're all going to think of lots of other opportunities they want to explore. Uh, they're going to think of lots of risks or lots of challenges that we're going to face as we're trying to, to do something in the space. And we capture them with these how might we's, HMW in the corner. Um, now, this is essentially just a way of gathering these thoughts, allowing us to move fast over the course of the week, um, but to be able to start to structure some of these thoughts, because it could be key important insights in these things that are very, very, uh, very, very important to help us be successful. And as all of these start to map out over the course of the day, we can then start to arrange them into different themes that perhaps merit some further exploration. Um, and we can see here just by, again, going back to that dot voting a little bit, you can start to see there are some key areas within product search that might be important, some interesting stuff around ordering, perhaps some stuff about logistics. Um, but this allows us to start to get really focused on the types of things we need to explore 
this week. And then we can take some of those key how might ways and start to put them back against key points on that customer map. So for example, when the high society person is asking for some options on whiskey, you know, we might have a, something we want to explore about how do we ensure customers feel they get the best whiskey for them. So you start to be able to explore these opportunity spaces in the context of that existing process. Now we can see quite quickly from here, that very first one related to asking for options looks like it's the one that's got the most dot votes. So for design sprint number one, the first week, this is the area that we're gonna to start to explore. And we've completed Monday, a huge amount of progress, a huge amount of stuff covered, you know, but we're early in the week, we've got a long way to go yet. So day two, sketching. This is where we start to get that little bit more real and really start to understand a bit more about that particular space where uh, we're digging into. And we start this quite often by doing some flash demos of other businesses or other industries that are already solving these types of challenges fairly well, in this case, ordering. So no surprise, Amazon might be in there, Netflix, Nike, Intuit, some of these businesses that might have already considered what ordering is and delivered it particularly well within the market. And then following that, we start to go on to design or sketch up some very high level ideas of how we could handle ordering effectively within this whiskey space. So for example, here we've got some kind of mobile app or some kind of uh, web app that allows people to enter in the type of whiskey that they want, you know, based on perhaps price or flavors or geographic locations. Um, someone else, probably Al Capone's, come up with the idea of a Facebook Messenger. Uh, I don't think there's any self-respecting enterprise in the world that doesn't have some kind of bot uh, development that's going on. Uh, and then the third design that's up is some kind of lifestyle selector. So the idea here being um, perhaps by asking somebody who's using this app different questions about the lifestyle choices, you know, do they, do they have a car? Where do they like to go on holiday? What flavors do they like? Perhaps the combination of those things could help that person select the whiskey that's right for them. So another big day, lots of uh, different ideas that are coming together and we park it at that point and don't revisit again until the Wednesday. Wednesday is deciding day. So we've already done a huge amount of background on the problems, the opportunities, we've sketched some solutions. We now come back with a fresh head on the Wednesday uh, and we give everybody the opportunity to start to dot vote on different features, ideas, concepts uh, that could be interesting for them. And what we find quite quickly on the Wednesday is quite a few people are leaning towards that lifestyle configurator or lifestyle or ordering support or whiskey. So that is the one that we're now going to progress on to uh, getting real customer feedback on this week. So how do we do that? Well, we start on the Wednesday afternoon by storyboarding the process. We need to understand how do we create a prototype or a journey through a prototype that is real enough to get good quality customer feedback. Now, in this case, this is probably going to start from the App Store. So we're going to have to somehow fake up uh, an app store experience. Uh, we want the person who we're testing with to be able to search for the app within there. They're going to then install this app within uh, on their phone, on their smart device. You know, in this case, it's called Shlan Javan. They're met with a little questionnaire or a, a, you know, five simple questions. They can go on and start. And once they start, they'll perhaps be faced with an image and a slider. So in this case, you know, do they prefer delicate taste to the left? or more smoky taste to the right. Um, and obviously the different images are gonna change the further down each direction that they go. And perhaps there's some other axes that we can consider as well. So we've got delicate and smoky, tranquil and wild, light and rich, perhaps countryside to mega city, uh, serenity to adventure. So the assumption being that these are some of the key things that would allow us to match somebody uh, with a whiskey uh, that suits them. So prototyping, I said before, this is a day where things start to become that little bit more magic. Um, now, I'll put my hand up first of all and say I am not a designer in any way, shape or form. I'm a technologist fundamentally. Um, 
but everything that you see here, everything, any prototypes I share from now on, they're all things that I've created myself. It's not particularly difficult. The tools make these things really quite easy. Um, so anybody can have a go at this and, and hopefully get some really good results. So here you can see the prototype that was created. This took me a few hours uh, to pull together. And what you see now on is all fake. So this is a fake example of the App Store. Um, this is a, a fake search. So we would be running through with the customer uh, a script that says, okay, go and search for this app called Schlangeva. It means good health. It's a toast uh, that we have in Scotland. So then we guide them through installing and then we guide them through interacting with the app. So here you can see the different images that represent the different uh, kind of axes. So tranquility in this case, uh, perhaps we want to go with a light taste like an apple or a rich taste like some kind of toffee or fudge, uh, you know, a mega city or countryside, what's your preferences? Um, not particularly clear how these would relate to anyone's whiskey tastes, but it's a concept, it's an idea, and this allows us to go ahead and, uh, and test this out. So a fairly straightforward uh, prototype, didn't take long to create, but it allows us to get really quick feedback from customers when we put it in front of them that otherwise would have taken many months and potentially wasted money to develop. So the final day of our first design sprint, we're on to testing. And what we do here is we, you know, I mentioned before, we have a script so that we can attempt to guide people through uh, the prototyping experience. We will try to avoid that being leading or biased as far as possible. And there's a real skill, a real knack to being able to, to create these types of tests and sessions. But then somebody who's uh, working with the, the person that we're testing with will be in one room, usually with a little camera pointing down at a device uh, so that other people can watch remotely. And then in a room beside there, we'll have the rest of the design sprint team with a massive wall uh, set out like a grid, something like this, where we've got the people we're testing with down the left-hand side, and then some of the key areas that we, we want to test against along the top. Um, so you can see here, generally, how was that? From a privacy perspective, are people comfortable? What was the App Store experience like? And so on. And what we find quite quickly from this testing session, when we pull out some key insights, is somebody that we tested with doesn't want whiskey products linked to their personal phone. And of course, that makes complete sense. It's prohibition. You could be arrested for having any involvement with alcohol. So it makes sense that people would be uncomfortable with having that linked to a smartphone. It seems difficult to get this app from the App Store. Well, Schlangeva is a nice name for an app because it's, it's quite appropriate as a toast. Uh, but of course, I don't think Gaelic is particularly easy to find uh, in the app store. So perhaps something in there that wouldn't have been considered if we didn't get this feedback at this stage. I don't understand why I get a gift as a gift whiskey. So there's something about the concept or about you know, how this whole process uh, works that just doesn't land with some users. It looks a bit tricky and is a bit confusing overall. And then the final bit of feedback, um, how will these questions get me a good whiskey? Uh, and if I'm completely honest, I would be in that category. Uh, I would not trust any of those questions to find me a good whiskey. So I think the, the underlying concept fundamentally doesn't seem to work for some customers. So we've got to the end of our first design sprint. We've created a, a prototype that's a good representation of an idea. We've put it in front of customers. And at the moment, the feedback looks pretty damning. So I don't think this is something that we're going to invest time and money in development on. But it only cost us five days to figure that out. Now, quite often at this point, a team would perhaps just change a particular thing, just do a little pivot and perhaps do some more testing. But, you know, I prepared this presentation. I can kind of do what I like. So we're going to go uh, and explore a completely new concept instead. So design sprint number two. Um, we can move a little bit faster this time because let's face it, the mapping pace, we've already done this. Um, so the majority of the activities on Monday, other than identifying which of these we want to go after, we can probably not worry too much about that. So this time, we want to have a little look at how we can increase customers' access to ordering. 
Um, a key thing, how can people order whiskey really easily, really effectively, rather than having to be face to face with Rothstein's mob? Uh, I don't think high society would enjoy that particularly. So sketching, we've shot right through Monday. Now we're into the second day already. We start to sketch out some solutions for how this type of thing is solved in industry or different businesses. And then we quickly move on to taking a look at some of the solutions that we can see within the team. So for example, this time, uh, someone, Lansky and Costello perhaps, are suggesting they could have an Amazon Dash or, an Amazon, or a, a flick button. They could put this in the toilet beside your chair that you sit on. It could be in the kitchen. So anytime you want whiskey, you can press the button and your favorite whiskey is coming straight to you. Not a bad idea. Of course, you know, Al Capone, he's back in the Facebook bot idea, insisting that's the way to go, you know, like every good executive in a, a business does these days. Uh, and then a third idea comes in, which is, why don't we build an Alexa skill? You know, you could be sitting in the comfort of your home and just by talking to a device in the corner of your room, you can start to, you can start to order your whiskey. That could work. So here we are, we're through to deciding day already. Um, so as you can see already a much faster week because we've done so much of that pre-work in the first week. Now we can decide which of these ideas are the ones that we want to explore in more detail. And after some dot voting and a very upset Al Capone who wants to get that Facebook bot built, um, it looks like the team are starting to lean towards the idea of an Alexa skill, embracing voice UI and, and seeing what they can do in that space. So the afternoon, same as the last time, we move on to storyboarding. How do we create a real, uh, or as real as possible prototype so that people can explore what that's like to work with? Um, and there are some modern tools that make this really quite easy. Uh, when I first created this, uh, I used a tool called Sayspring. Uh, I think that's perhaps been bought over now, but there's lots of different tools that are in the same space that are cropping up. And they all almost have a, a, a kind of, way of defining your journey, uh, kind of journey mapping or storyboarding built into them uh, in this space. Uh, and in the prototyping day, you can essentially see what that looks like. So you can see we're building up a, a stream here, which is place order. You can see the different types of voice commands that might be triggered. You can build these trays of different commands and different conversations to be really quite complex. So this starts to become quite useful. And it allows us to produce something that looks a bit more like this. Hey Alexa, uh, could you open my prototypes please? Welcome to Say Spring. The available projects are Schlange. Which project would you like to open? Ah, uh, thanks Alexa. Uh, yeah, if you could open Schlange for me please, that would be great. Welcome to Schlange Ivar. What can I get you? Oh, uh, I would quite like two bottles of King's Ransom, please. Good choice. King's Ransom is a favourite of mine. Two bottles are on the way to you. Should I deliver them to your usual address? Uh, oh, no, I'm, I'm still at Gotopia. I'm watching at a friend's house. Could you send it straight there, please? Of course. Two bottles of King's Ransom are now on their way to your friend's house. Can I get you anything else? Uh, no, I think that's everything for tonight. Thank you very much, Alexa. Thank you for ordering. <clears throat> so, obviously, for all of us in this call, we know that this is fake. It's quite clear to us from a technology background that this is fake. Um, but for many customers that we test with, they can't tell the difference. Um, this looks like it works, and you'd be surprised how many times when I see these types of uh, testing sessions going, where people say, can I have this? Does it work now? Even people within the businesses that we're working with that might be using this process, they genuinely believe we've already created the thing. So it's, uh, it's quite surprising how much good quality feedback you can get from that. So, testing day. Uh, how, are we gonna, how are we gonna fare this time? Are we gonna get any better feedback from the last time? Well, when you're testing voice UI, it's a very similar process. You have one room where somebody who's uh, testing, somebody who has a script uh, can run through that. And then you have another room where people are watching remotely and they're capturing all of those insights from the same kind of wall. And um, depending on how creative you want to get with voice UI, 
you can have somebody in a microphone making a much more discursive conversation with the Alexa skill. Uh, and that can be quite interesting to see which directions people choose to go in. Um, but for now, I think we've got everything we need. So, proof time. How does this go? Well, a better start. Really convenient and quite natural. Fantastic. That's uh, more promising. It somehow feels safer than an app, but I'm not sure that it is. It might just be Alexa's nice voice. Okay, well, that starts to suggest that people still aren't quite comfortable when we think of that sprint question of, will people really disregard prohibition laws? Uh, perhaps they will if they feel safe, but there's still some challenges in that space, perhaps. How can this be traced back to me? So this is really starting to get to the crux of that, that matter again now. And then some positive, positive feedback to finish. This would entice me to buy some good scotch. So if I were Rothstein and I didn't want to bet on something where I wasn't sure of the outcome, this feels better, but it doesn't quite yet feel quite there. Um, the team would maybe pivot now and you know go down a slightly different route with the same idea, same concept. But again, it's my presentation. So we're going to do a completely different third design sprint. So here we go. It's the last design sprint of this morning. Let's see how that pans out. So mapping day, we know this inside out. We've had a look at this and refined it over a couple of sessions. This time, we want to look at how can we allow customers to sample whiskey before they buy. Now, that's going to be a really tricky thing to do under the nose of authorities when it's illegal to be having any kind of alcohol present. So that becomes quite an interesting challenge. Sketching time. Who else is having that problem or solving that problem really well within industry? There might be different things we can borrow or steal with absolutely no shame and uh, get that into our own business. And then, of course, we can start to sketch out some of our own solutions. So maybe somebody suggests Tinder for whiskey tasting. So you swipe left or you swipe right, depending on who you want to go and sample whiskey with and you know, try some different whiskeys you otherwise wouldn't have had access to. Finally, Al Capone has given up on the idea of a bot, uh, but this time he's come up with a whiskey tasting event where people have to put their details into the form. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work again. Still hitting up against the same privacy issues. And this, this is important, actually. It's, you know, it's not to say that every idea in here is a good idea. It's to get the conversations going that allows us to find the right idea through a bit of evolution and a bit of, uh, a bit of discussion. And then somebody else comes up with an idea of, could we, could we actually create a, a physical bottle? You know, some kind of high quality looking thing, perhaps a bit like an a, a kind of cosmetics bottle, like an Aesop kind of thing, where you can hide whiskey and you can somehow distribute that uh, out to the high society for testing. Um, so some very varied and different ideas in here. We take a break and we come back fresh for deciding day on the Wednesday. So, a little bit of dot voting. Poor Al Capone's still not any closer to having a result, but the team are seeming to gravitate towards this idea of a physical bottle of some kind. So, okay, fine. How are we going to possibly prototype that? Well, perhaps we need to get some kind of CAD drawing, some representation of what this thing's going to look like. So it's going to be some high quality bottle. It's going to have a, a hollow space on the inside. There needs to be some kind of test tube device. So something that can contain water and be watertight. And that's going to fit in the inside. Um, but it's not just going to sit there on its own. So perhaps it needs some kind of key that can allow you to, to twist that if you know where this hidden compartment is. Uh, now that's all going to piece together quite nicely so that when it's all uh, properly packaged and held together, anyone from the authorities isn't going to recognize what that is. Um, how do we distribute it? Well, it has to be high quality, it has to look really professional, but then we have the US Postal Service. So perhaps if this looks good enough and it's convincing enough and it's hidden enough, that secret compartment, perhaps the good old US Postal Service can distribute this for us right underneath the nose of the authorities with nobody really knowing what's going on. 
So fine, sounds good. Prototyping. This is starting to get tricky. So how are we going to do prototyping here? Well, I don't have the CAD skills to, to take that design any further. But again, thanks to new technologies and, and new business models out there, you've got tools like Upwork that allow you to quite easily connect with people that can do this kind of thing. You know, and any of you in your businesses can, you know, reach out on platforms like Upwork and find the key people with skills that are needed. So in this case, uh, I found Darko. Um, Darko had some uncomfortable conversations with me where he interrogated the idea of why I needed to smuggle anything. Um, but after a while, he got comfortable with the idea and he produced this for me. So this is a, a 3D representation uh, of that, that bottle for carrying a whiskey uh, built from Darko's uh, CAD designs. Um, this is on a, a platform called 3D Hubs. Um, so I was able to upload the CAD files and then it allows you to, to look at things in detail online. It gives you some feedback. Uh, you can see here down the right hand side where there might be some challenges potentially with how thick or thin things are. Um, but this gave me a really good idea of the fact that, yeah, this actually looks achievable. That, that screw cap could work, it could fit in the bottom, uh, the key could unlock things. So this was looking good. But I didn't want to stop there. Um, 3D Hubs allows you to connect with people that have got 3D printers. Uh, and living in Sweden at the time, I found, uh, I found this chap, Joachim. Uh, Joachim, he used to work in R&D. Uh, and his ambition was when he left his R&D role to have his own lab where he could just do things all day long. And he built this 3D printer for himself. So again, some challenging conversations around why I wanted to do this. He then very kindly said, okay, I'll print it for you. And I'll even film the recording. I'll even firm, uh, film the printing. So this is the very bottle that you see here. And lo and behold, thanks to 3D printing and... Uh, the use of Upwork to find Darko. We have our high quality bag for the US Postal Service to deliver. And within this bag, the demo goes are smiling. We have our high quality aesthetic bottle, a cosmetics bottle. And if you can see on the bottom there, you can see the, the opening where the hidden compartment would be. And we have the, the key. I can just turn this here. And hidden within the bottle, we have our secret compartment to be filled with whiskey. And that can open right up. This, uh, this is actually made uh, from the things that soda bottles are made from. Apparently they, they heat these things up and, and blow into them to give them shape. Uh, but it essentially acts as a, a watertight um, whiskey carrier in this case. So actually we've been able to prototype the full thing. So, what happens now, testing day? Well, obviously this will be a little bit more difficult than having a, a device and a, a camera in one room, but you can get really quite creative about how you test. So you could be testing in somebody's home, you know, you, you get someone in a, a postal service uniform to knock on the door, hand over the package, explore whether or not people can find the hidden compartment. So there are ways to do these kinds of things. How does this turn out now? Well, initial feedback, I love that it's a secret compartment. Um, that sounds quite pro promising. People feel like they're in some kind of tight gang and they can do something that uh, other people don't know. They feel part of a, a bigger thing. This feels exciting and I get to sample whiskey. Well, that was the thing that we really wanted to achieve. How can we get whiskey into the hands of people so they can sample and try new things? I like that I can try before I buy, I can be more adventurous. Well, that's a nice knock-on impact here. If people are trying out new whiskies, perhaps Ross Stein and his gang can open up new routes from Scotland with new whiskies that they otherwise didn't have before. And then I think might have a sampling party with friends. Well, this is awesome. Invite your friends around, sample some whiskies, create some orders. I, I think there's a business model in that in itself. So, here we go, we've got to the end of our third design sprint. We've done everything from uh, some basic exploration of an app, some voice UI, right through to a physical product. So the tools are available for us these days to be able to test out anything that we want with only a few short 
uh, hours and days to put behind that. So we don't need to be stuck in this world of spending months and even years building out products and services without ever having that customer feedback. Now, at the beginning, uh, the name of the talk was about building agility with design sprints. And, you know, design sprints were never intended to be about developing agility within any business. It was designed to be able to get that really rapid feedback. But one of the key things that I've found with this type of practice uh, over the last few years is when you start to move at this speed, it's got a really interesting impact on people who work within the business. You know, when you go away from two or three month pre-studies and big long development cycles to a space where you can get feedback within a few days and then you can transition very quickly into different ways of uh, thinking about product development and building those products. You know, organizations are forced into a space where they think differently and they start to become much more fluid and much more customer centric. You, know, you can see straight away that these, these design sprints are fundamentally about individuals and interactions. You know, there's been customers in from the beginning, there's been cross-functional uh, skill sets and people collaborating from the beginning. There's been working prototypes, um, three of them within three short weeks. And like I said, I, I created all of these, not being a designer, uh, <laughs> the exception of the physical bottle. Um, customer collaboration is a key thing. You know, every time we do a design sprint, we're getting real customer feedback and the value of that product. So we know that we're zoning in on the thing that needs to take our business forward. And finally, that ability to respond to change. This isn't about blindly following a plan or it's not about proving that some leader's idea is the best idea and we should build it. This is about getting real feedback and responding to that feedback and pivoting and trying a different variation or trying something completely new altogether. Now, I think it was at Copenhagen, go to Copenhagen a few years ago, Linda Rising was talking about experimentation and she spoke a little bit about agility in there and she coined this phrase, I thought this was wonderful, a culture of people willing to learn, that is my definition of agile. I, I, th I think that couldn't be more true and this is fundamentally what design sprints are about. It's about learning, it's about culture, it's about collaboration. If any of you are interested in trying out a design sprint, um, this is Jake Knapp, um, he came up with the process at Google Ventures. Uh, the book that you see on the right hand side here has everything that you need uh, to get going with the process. It guides you through the week on a step by step basis, an hour by hour basis, um, it's really valuable. There's also a huge amount of information if you Google for uh, Sprint, you know, solving big problems and testing just five days online. There's a website that's dedicated to this kind of thing loads of examples of how people have uh, applied the, the process as well. Thank you and good luck if anybody chooses to go ahead and, and try one. Thank you.